I invite us to open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, as we continue our journey through the book, the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. We're in the fifth chapter. We'll look at the first 13 verses as our unit of thought, and may I remind us as we go through the letter to the church at Corinth, we will find it identifies just about every problem, almost every situation that any church in history past and present could face in the local New Testament church. In a moment, we'll read the thirteen first 13 verses, but may I introduce it by simply making a brief mention about some of the facts that are born out in history. In fact, history will bear the fact that believers living like the world and the lost people are living like church members many times in society today. Uh, in fact, uh, someone said false thinking leads to false living. False thinking leads to false living. And may I remind us the church at Corinth was made up of those members, listen carefully, this sets the stage. And as I tell the students in hermeneutics, look at the culture, the context, and the background. The culture and the context of the church at Corinth was that they had come out of idol worship, and some of the idols was in the temple of Diana, where the worship service was made up of sexual orgies. Now, I know that's the most ridiculous thing to the Western mind that we could ever perceive, but that was the reality of it. And so in the setting that we see in this text, some of those that had come out of that, they had gotten saved under the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul had led them to faith in Christ in the church at Corinth. But they began to fall back into some of their practices that they had been blood-bought, Bible-saved, and brought out of as Christians. And as a result of that, some of the things that were taking place in the church, the Christians, the church members, rather than facing it as sin, calling it sin, dealing with it as sin, said, in essence, we love you too much. We're just going to have a come by y'all moment. We're going to embrace you in what I call sloppy agape. And that's what they were doing in the church at Corinth. And you'll find that throughout the 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians. They were dealing with sin on the basis that the Apostle Paul said they were puffed up, they were prideful, rather than facing and correcting it. And the sin that they were to correct, as we'll see in a moment, a young man living in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother, and yet it was open, it was understood, it was public knowledge, and yet nothing was being done from the church leadership role in correcting it. Now, may I hasten to put a little footnote to that. That which we're looking at in the broadest sense is talking about church discipline. Majority of the churches today will not practice church discipline. Why is that so? Because in church discipline, you will lose church members. In about 35 years, we've had the awesome responsibility on two occasions of having to practice church discipline. It doesn't make friends easily. It doesn't win influence among many of the members because the mindset is, you just run Joe off, you run Charlie off, and it's wrong. We loved him so much. That's the same mindset that you find in this text in the church at Corinth. And as a result of that, the Apostle Paul said, you cannot do it. You've got to put him out of the fellowship. And lest I forget to mention it, the reason for church discipline is not to ruin the brother, but to restore the brother in the body of Christ. It's not out of hatred and retribution. It's so that you might restore the brother that's in sin. And keep in mind, in this context, in the text, it's talking about one that is saved, that's living in sin, that needs to be dealt with, and it ought to be dealt with on the basis of church discipline as the Bible directs. In fact, it is not just commended, it's commanded biblically. But as one dear pastor that's internationally known said on one occasion that you could go across America and 99.99% .99 of the time you will never hear a pastor preaching on the subject of church discipline. So I'm calling this sloppy agape. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word. As I read audibly, follow with me in your scripture silently. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 13. 
It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have, or, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath do, so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit be with uh, spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for Christ even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or the coveters, or the extortioners, or, the, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or coveter or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such one not know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among you yourselves, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Thank you, and we may be seated. Very briefly, I want to look at three points, three main things that I have divided this text in the context for what I believe the Scripture would have us to understand. And that is, first of all, in verse 1 and 2, the sinful problem recorded. In verses 3 through 5, the spiritual punishment required. Verses 6 through 13, the spoilage potential revealed. Notice in verses 1 and 2, it sets the stage for the balance of this unit of thought. Notice, first of all, this specific problem. It is reported commonly that there is fornication. That word, by the way, let me just clarify some things. It's a misnomer of the old school of old theologians of years gone by. The word fornication, there's the word pornea. We get our word pornography from that word. Pornea is talking about any sexual sin. Now, there's some old preachers of yesteryear that will say uh, fornication is sexual, uh, immoral, uh, illicit sexual sin among uh, those that are not married, and that adultery is sexual sin among those that are married. That is simply not true. Pornea is the umbrella of all sexual sins. And under that umbrella, if you picture an umbrella, under that umbrella, every sexual sin, including adultery, under the team, under the term pornea. So may I remind us, he says, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Here the Apostle Paul points out specific problem, and that specific problem is sexual sin in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. A man living in a sexual relationship with his stepmother. There are three things about this that must be understood for us to get a grasp on it, a handle on it, and understand the seriousness and the weightiness of this text in comparison to what is happening in 21st century New Testament churches, especially in America today. First of all, notice the sin is public. The sin is public. It is reported commonly, that is openly and publicly, that there is fornication among you. It's not something that was just hidden under the umbrella of the church. It's not something that was just in the church at Corinth and the uh, passerbys did not understand it, did not know it. It was not hidden. They didn't hide it. They didn't try to sequester it in any way. It's open sexual immorality, and it is what would be called in terms today, they used to call it this, no longer, it's just having a live-in relationship. But it's what used to be called back in my day a shacked up living situation, if I can be very blunt and pointed with what it was called back eons ago. 
But today it's simply a living right. I am always amazed when I talk with a couple, when I talk with a family, go into a home. How long have you been married? Well, we've been together for 18 years. We got married two years ago. Uh, that is a normal response in society in which we're living in today. This sin is public. Everyone is, uh, it know, everyone knows it. It's open. The community knew it. The church knew it. And in that society, they knew it. The citizens knew it. It was open. The public sexual sin could destroy the church. And may I remind us today, uh, we're talking about those that have that mindset and that attitude that it's okay. And it's in our churches. I remember back in 1978. That's a little while ago. I had the privilege of doing a, a revival meeting in a church up in uh, Yulee. won't call the name of the church because this might be aired, and I do not want to call the name of the church, but it's in Yulee. And I had the privilege of being there. That was back in the day when he started on a revival service on a Sunday morning to go through the following Sunday morning, eight full services. And in that particular church, I noticed that as I would uh, go out with the uh, then pastor, he had been there for less than a year. When I'd go out knocking on doors with him, there was a cold, callous, almost rebellion toward anything about church and the church. Now, we're finding that more today, but I was curious as to the problem, because after the first two or three days of doing that, I asked the pastor, I said, it is obvious there's a problem in the community in relationship to the church. And I understand that to a degree if it's lost people, but I sense a coldness, a nonchalantness. And he said, well, let me just tell you the history of what causes that. He said, I've been here less than a year. The church was without a pastor for almost five years. But he said the previous pastor and his uh, church member lover were in bed together when the husband came home early from work and shot both of them dead there in the bed. He said as a result of that, it's known all over the community, and the community just simply does not want to have anything to do with this church. Therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem that the Apostle Paul is dealing with with the church at Corinth. There was the mindset that it's sin, but it's okay because we love you. We're going to embrace you. And the whole city, the whole community, all of society was aware of it. The sin is public. Secondly, the sin is pornographic. The scripture says there is fornication, that is pernia, sexual immorality, perversion before God. It is the same word, as I said earlier, that's used in our term pornography. That's where we get the basic root word for in that term. Our English word simply comes from that word. You see, it conveys the idea of using our bodies for lustful, sinful purposes, both men and women. And that's the idea that the Apostle Paul is dealing with. He says this sin is public, this sin is pornographic, this sin is absolutely preposterous. Listen to what he says, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. The Apostle Paul said this sin is so preposterous that even the heathens do not practice this kind of sinful relationship. It is a practice that ought not to be done in any setting, much less in the church, the Apostle Paul is saying. This sexual sin, by the way, is condemned in the Old Testament, Leviticus 18.8, Deuteronomy 22.30. It's cursed in Deuteronomy 27.20. One committing this sin is to be put to death in Deuteronomy 22.22. Aren't you thankful that we live in the day of grace, the age of grace, where sin is forgiven and forgotten and flung as far as the uh, east is from the west, according to the Scripture? That's grace. That's God's mercy and forgiveness when sin is confessed and brought to him. But here in the church at Corinth, they were allowing this young man in the church. And no telling how many others, and we'll see in a moment, that's what Paul is talking about, how it will spread like leaven, how it will spread like bacteria and destroy the whole body. But here the Apostle Paul is reminding them this sin is horrific. It is sin, the sin is public. It's pornographic. It's preposterous. Notice not only the specific problem, but notice the selfish pride in t verse 2. And ye, speaking of the church, the believers at Corinth, ye, the community of faith in the church, and ye are puffed up. That's literally prideful arrogant, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you? The public, pornographic, perverted, preposterous sin did not even bring sadness or sorrow or mourning among the believers in the church. It was not something that caused them to be concerned seemingly whatsoever. 
may remind us, someone said the prideful arrogance had swollen their heads instead of breaking their hearts. And that is too often the case in churches today. It's the politically correct thing to do in our churches today. If you don't believe that, just look at the number of denominations that have openly embraced the sodomite lifestyle. Most all of the mainline denominations have said, we love you. And the scripture in John 15, 17 says that we're to love one another. And it's the command that these churches are basing all that they're doing on is that we love you and therefore that sloppy agape, it's okay whatever lifestyle you're living. We're just going to embrace you because after all, as one mega preacher in Atlanta, Andy Stanley said, fellowship is more important than doctrine and theology. And what he's simply saying, let's just embrace everybody. It doesn't make any difference your lifestyle. We just want to have numbers, nickels, and noses. And that's the mindset in churches so often. It's the toleration of sin. They were proud of their toleration of that sin. It's the politically correct thing to do even today, to say, this is okay. It's politically correct to say, and may I deviate for a slight moment. It's politically correct today to embrace the lifestyle of Islam and say that there's nothing wrong with it. As Rick Warren says, that we're all sister religions, that Jesus Christ is okay with that, and the Christianity is okay. We're sister religion to Islam. And I could go on and on and on with the mindset today that we're just going to have that sloppy agape to love everybody regardless of what you do and what you say and the lifestyle and whatever religious uh, declension that may be out there. We're simply going to accept it. The Apostle Paul is talking about that self, selfish pride and as a result of that selfish pride, it prevented them from spiritual sorrow. He said, you have not mourned. It prevented them from spiritual separation that he might be taken away from among you, lit to remove, put out, and the term is disfellowshipped. Disfellowshipped. Paul says that's what you ought to do as we sit a moment. The scripture is clear in Ephesians 5, 27, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be pure and spotless and without blemish. That doesn't mean, listen very, very clearly, lest a person misunderstand the text and the biblical doctrine about separation from sin as the body of Christ. Everyone under the sound of my voice, including this preacher, we're all sinful creatures, but we're saved by grace. Our sin has been forgiven. It's under the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are not to go out and sin because the sin is under the blood. It is presumptuous sin. And the scripture in Romans chapter 6 commands, demands, directs that we ought not to do that. We ought not to say that because we're saved and sin is under grace that we ought not to say we can go and sin as we please. And yet somehow, some way, that seems to be the mindset in the public arena today among churches and church members. Not only do we see the sinful problem recorded, but notice in verses 3 through 5, the spiritual punishment required. Notice in verse 3 and 4, the spiritual procedure. For, Gar, because I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged. Huh. That sound familiar? Let me just get on a little, how would you say, a little bandwagon of mine. You know, you're just judging me. You ought not judge me. As Bill Maher said on one occasion, Christians just want to put their finger in your eye and point out some sin. I'm not advocating that person, but anyway. He says, because I verily absent in the body, present in the spirit, have judged. That means already decided, already determined, already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. Verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, that is the church, the gathering, the body of Christ, the congregation coming together, and my spirit, that is, as though I am present, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says the procedure for church discipline is set forth. And if we were doing the study on that, and we've done so in the course a semester long in the college on ecclesiology. Part of ecclesiology is studying church discipline. 
What is church discipline? How is it carried out? What is the policy? What's the procedure? What's the purpose of church discipline? Let me just give you the little truncated, young blood narrated version for the uh, benefit of this text. When we talk about that, you go to Matthew chapter 15, I mean chapter 18, verse 15 to 20. It's a very, very succinct statement. And by the way, there are a lot of folks that misunderstand Matthew 18, verse 15 and following. Because in verse 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven and again I say unto you that if two or, three, two or more agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask it should be done for them of my father which is in heaven where two or three are gathered together in my name there am I in the midst of them that's part of the unit of thought chapter 18 verse 15 through 20 and that's verse 18, 19, and 20. And it has to do with church discipline. It's not talking about if there's two or three of us gathered, there's the Holy Spirit. If that's the case, if I'm by myself, the Holy Spirit ain't there. If I can use poor grammar. <laughs> that's not what the Scripture's saying. It is simply the end result of what is talked about in verse 15 and following. Uh, the brother that is in sin, you go to the brother. If he hears you and he asks for forgiveness and he asks Christ for forgiveness, it's done and over as though it has never taken place. But if he refuses to, go back with one or more witnesses. That comes out of the Deuteronomy text requiring two witnesses. And it's not a matter of two witnesses that, well, I'm going, preacher, I'll go with you. I'll be a witness to what you're saying. No, no, no. There must be two witnesses as to the offense that you're confronting the brother with. Or it is invalid biblically from the concepts that's found in the Scripture. And the Scripture says to go with him, go to that brother by yourself. If he refuses to hear, then you go back with uh, two or more witnesses. If he refuses to hear, take it to the church. And when you take it to the church, it simply means go before the church and say, we have gone to him, this is the procedure, this is what the scripture says, we followed the scripture principle, the scriptural principle, letter by letter, he's refused to do so, we are now removing his name from the church role. By the way, church discipline does not have any connotation in the scripture where you bring it before the church and then we take a vote on whether or not to remove the brother. It's not there at all. It is the leadership's responsibility to go through the process and then announce to the uh, membership, this is what has happened, and this is what we've had to do. Literally, the Scripture is very, very clear in the uh, uh, text in relationship to that. It's tell the brother, then uh, take the witnesses, tell the church, and then take him out of the church. That's the the simplistics of it. And again, it's not to ruin the brother, but to restore him. It's not to tear him down, but to restore him. And the purpose is to bring shame in his life that he will confess sin and say, God, forgive me, and go back into the fellowship of the church and to be a fellowshipping brother and not one that's arrogant brother going awry from what the Scripture says. Not only we see the spiritual procedure, but the spiritual power, verse 4. With power, that is authority, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says, ladies and gentlemen at the church at Corinth, if you do this, you're doing it based on the authority of Christ himself. It's not a matter of saying, well, this is what Baptists believe, or this is what Methodists do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, most view Baptist churches and Baptist ministry as the no, 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 do nothing church. No smoking, no drinking, no cussing, no fussing, no dancing, et cetera, et cetera. It's the no-no denomination, as I've heard folks call it. No, it's simply going by the Word of God. What does the Scripture say? If the Scripture says it, we ought to be obedient to it. Nothing more and nothing less. The spiritual power. I made a little marginal note how sad to have pride that says, oh, I love you so much, and yet I'm going to allow you to wall in sin and say nothing and do nothing about it. The church not only has the divine authority to discipline a sinning, erring brother, but also the command to do so, according to Second Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15, Titus 3, 10, and I could go on and on. Not only do we see the spiritual procedure and the spiritual power, but notice the spiritual purpose in verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Powerful statement. I want us to notice twofold. It's purposeful discipline and it's powerful deliverance. Notice the scripture says, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. The apostle Paul says, ladies and gentlemen at Corinth, put that dude out of the church. Let his sin destroy his flesh. That's what's going to happen. 
In fact, I read an article just last week up in, uh, I believe it's New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken, was the headline, where the STD rates have skyrocketed some 246% just in the past 36 months. And on a national scale, it is off the charts. But what we find in society today, the news media is simply refusing to report it. They're saying nothing as though it's not taking place. But we have such a lax lost society today, and as a result of that loose living, and as a result of that, it is the destruction of the physical bodies. The purposeful discipline. A life of sexual sin, immorality, and living in the flesh will destroy the body. Not only do we see its purposeful dis discipline, but notice the powerful deliverance. Notice the purpose now, that the spirit may be saved. Deliver the body, that Satan can have the flesh, that he can be his spirit, i.e., as a saved person, he can be delivered in the day of the Lord Jesus. Church discipline, as I've said before, is not to ruin, but to restore. In fact, in Galatians 6, 1, it says, restore such an one. This indicates that the man was saved but living in sin. I said also how sad it is that churches today will tolerate sin rather than obeying what the Scripture says in carrying out church discipline. And I realize that's not a happy subject, is it? That's not something we relish the thought of. But it's part of biblical truth. It's part of doctrinal truth. And it's the part that's rarely, rarely ever preached on. It's rarely ever talked about in any New Testament church today. In fact... It is so rare that what I'm saying to you now is not heard from 99.99% .99 of the pulpits. But if you're preaching verse by verse and chapter by chapter and expository exegetical preaching, you must cover what God's Word says without any exemption. Not only do we see the sinful problem recorded and the spiritual punishment required, but I want us to notice the spoilage potential revealed in verses 6 through 13. Notice what happens to a church that tolerates immoral living in the church. What happens? What takes place? Notice, first of all, the sheer pollution in verse 6. You're glorying, that is, you're boasting, you're bragging, you're being puffed up with pride, is not good, honorable, kelos, not honorable. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole loaf? That's what makes hot yeast rolls taste so good. <laughs> There's a bakery, I've not seen or been there, but I've read about it. The bakery in San Francisco, of all places, that brag about having some of the best uh, yeast rolls, sourdough bread rolls, and loaf bread, loaves of bread. They have a special bacteria, supposedly, that's used in it. And out of each lump, each loaf, each lump of the dough, they will keep a fistful, and it will be cooled, and the next time they mix dough, they will put that in it so that it continues the same process, and it literally is a process of the putrefaction of the bread. It is the bacteria that makes it rise. It's the bacteria that makes it enlarge. It's the bacteria that causes the spoilage, that causes the dough or the batch to grow, if you will. They were proud of that leaven in the loaf of bread, if you will, there at Corinth. They didn't realize that unchecked the sin would pollute the whole church. In fact, let's see, left page, left column, chapter 2, Church of Thyatira in the book of the Revelation, about verse 27, 26. The problem there was that they were leading the members to uh, involve themselves in immorality and in fornication in the church. And that was practiced by that uh, uh, witch spirit as it is found in the text. It is as a result of immorality not being checked in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very nature of sin is to diffuse itself, to expand itself, and to grow. And I was saddened a number of years ago, and by, in fact, it went back into the mid-90s. Some of you might know the name Willow Creek Church and Willow Creek Ministries, Bill Hybels. And it was in the early 2000s that he finally recognized the error. don't know what he's doing now, but he published a major paper on the subject that we were wrong and what they were doing had been wrong for so many years. But on one occasion, on uh, a... 
uh, how would you call it, a psychologist program on national radio, the one that was speaking on national radio, the psychologist, had a letter from a member of the church that Bill Hybels had founded and was the pastor. And the letter was from a person that's a practicing, a practicing homosexual. And the letter, as it was being opened out of the envelope, you could hear it on the microphone. And this dear person on radio read it. And his words were, I would to God that every pastor could be like this pastor and what he's done in this church. And this letter went something like this. I'm a practicing homosexual. Been a member of this church for two years. I've been in Sunday school. I've been to the social engagement parties. I've been to all of the meetings, etc., etc. And this entire church has simply loved me, embraced me, and they have never condemned me and called my lifestyle a sin. What's wrong with that picture? It's not a biblical church when sin is embraced, that sin that is open, that sin that is public, that sin that is known by the community, that sin that's understood by all of the citizens around. It's sure pollution, the scripture says. You can take a barrel of Washington State red apples, a bushel basket of them, Take one that's rotten and put it in the center. Put that bushel basket of apples over in the closet for 30 days and you pull it back out and the majority of the apples are spoiled because of touching on that one that's spoiled. And that same thing is sin diffuses itself. A number of years ago, my bride will recall it. I think she and probably one other that would recall it. Probably 25 years ago, we had uh, a number of young couples, and we discovered that there was a particular video that they were watching, and they were having the video parties at their homes. And this video was being passed around. This one this week, this one next week, this one the following week. And it was discovered. And they were approached by it that this is rotten, it is wrong, it is uh, sin, you ought not do that. And the mindset was, preacher, you're not supposed to tell me what to do. I'm 18, I'm white, and I can do whatever I want to do. Mindset. That is simply what the scripture is talking about here. You cannot leave sin alone. It will diffuse itself and will pollute the whole body of Christ. And that's what Paul is saying to them. The sheer pollution. But notice in verse 7 and 8 the spiritual purging that must take place. Notice what it says. He says, purge out therefore. Purge out therefore. That is to remove, cut out, clean thoroughly. The old leaven, that is the spoilage, the sin, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Notice a couple of things. Notice the pointed command and the positional cause. The pointed command, he says, purge it out, remove it. He didn't say, now I want you to sit down, have prayer meeting, I want you to vote on it, decide what. You can tell it wasn't a Baptist church because he didn't say vote on it. He said, I want you to remove the sin, remove the leaven. I don't think there's any way that you can be any clearer in what's said. And it's not this, this is not the only text, by the way, that deals with church discipline. There are two or three dozen verses that spell it out. And I've organized it and spelled it out. And on some occasions I teach an entire a seminar on the subject of church discipline because it is so vital and so needful in our churches today. The pointed command, purge out the old leaven, the sin. There must be the complete removal, the cutting out, the completely cleaning it up. Listen very carefully. When that person is disfellowship, it doesn't say that he can't come back to church and worship. It doesn't say that he can't come back and shouldn't come back and shouldn't be encouraged to come and sit under gospel preaching. That's okay. He simply is barred from being considered a member in fellowship in good standing with the body of Christ. And it's designed to bring about shame and sin for the sin and remorse to the point of restoration in the body of Christ. Unleavened. Ye are unleavened, he says, without sin, without, and you need to be pure. How is that so? Because even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Literally, Jesus died, shed his rich red royal blood on Calvary's cross to cleanse us from all of our sin. We see not only the pointed command, but the positional cause in verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast of 
that is the celebration of the Feast of Passover, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of sin, the leaven meaning of sin, malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, that is genuineness and truth, the Scripture says. Because Jesus is our sacrifice, the Scripture is telling us, he is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. His blood cleanses us and claims us for himself. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Keep on celebrating, the Apostle Paul said, the perpetual celebration, not with old leaven, that is not with sin. Continue to celebrate that celebration with new leaven, that is not the old leaven, but removing it from the body of Christ. Not with that sin in your midst, he's saying. And he says, not with malice, not with malice. That is literally the principle of sin or wickedness. That is the practice of sin. But with the unleavened bread, that is the pure, clean bread, we're to be holy before the Lord, the Scripture says. Sincerity and truth. Talking about sincerity, it's the purity of attitude. Truth is the purity of action. Not only the sheer pollution and the spiritual purging, but notice verse 9, 10, and 11, separation prohibited. The separation prohibited. Notice two or three things. First of all, it's required of the Christians to remain pure. Notice verse 9 and 10, separate from the unsaved fornicators. I wrote unto you in an epistle. By the way, it's a good study here. Paul says, I wrote, this is in 1 Corinthians, but he's talking about a previous epistle he's written to them. Uh, theologians and academics in the sense contend that there's probably three letters that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. We are preserved for our edification in the canonized scripture only First and Second Corinthians, when in reality, based on the context of the text itself, there was probably three letters that Paul had written to the church. He says here, I wrote unto you, past tense, an epistle, that's a letter. Really, it should have been First Corinthians if that was the case. Not to company, that is to have association with fornicators, that is sexual immorality. And he says, you ought not to have that relationship, you ought not to have that company with, you ought not to fellowship with. In fact, I can recall my mother on one occasion saying, birds of a feather flock together. You ever heard that term? <laughs> There's an old saying, if you wallow with the pigs, you'll get mud on you. And that's what Paul is saying in a less dramatic term. In verse 10, the Apostle Paul reminds them that they are in the world. Notice what he says in verse 10 quickly. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world or with the covetous or extortioners or with the idolaters, for then must needs go out of the world. Ye go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or extortioner, with such and one know not to eat. Eating indicates fellowship together. And if there's the known sin, there ought to be the separation from that known sin. The Apostle Paul in that 10th verse reminds them that they're in the world. And in the world, Paul says, we're going to meet all these sinful creatures in the world. Now that doesn't, again, let me go back and uh, footnote and uh, strengthen the foundation of what I'm saying. That doesn't mean that we as Christians are supposed to be viewed as sinless people. We're sinners saved by grace. And that ought to be, ought to be reminded of that constantly. But the Apostle Paul is saying that we're going to meet those that we work with, those who are greedy, immoral, and false worshipers, and railers, and drunkards, and extortioners. We can't avoid sinners in the world in which we're living in, but we are not to accompany with, not to associate with, and as I put it, not to buddy around with them as we would with believers, with Christians. And secondly, not only separate from unsaved fornicators, but separate from saved fornicators, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, not to associate with, if any that is called a brother, a believer, a Christian, one that is saved, be a fornicator, panea, sexual sin, immorality, or covetous, or idolater, or railer, or drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Recently, I had uh, an individual in a class say something about someone that's a member of that church that that particular person is in that's a drunkard. And the question was, how should we respond? What should be done? I said, the leadership, the pastoral leadership needs to go and have a conference 
needs to go with him armed with the word of God. There are over 100 verses of scripture that says that for a God-fearer, that's the Old Testament believer, a God-fearer, you're not to be in the presence of it. You're not to touch it. You're not to pass it on to someone else. There are over 100 verses that says for a Christian, we're not to have anything to do with alcoholic beverages at all. And yet somehow, some way, it's bad enough to know that our churches today across America, in fact, I can name you churches and pastors uh, that are within a stone's throw of this campus here that think there's nothing at all wrong with having a good old time. Probably over the football weekend season, they probably had a uh, case of Bud Dummer and Miller Lowlife that they enjoyed uh, because they view that as not being problematic as a Christian. And the Apostle Paul is simply reminding the church at Corinth, you need to be pure before Christ. You need to make sure that the leaven is removed. You need to make sure that the sin is not not involved in the permeation of all of the Christian church. Do you realize that even sitting to eat in fellowship, Paul says, with someone that claims to be saved and is involved in sexual sin gives validation and approval for that sin? The Scripture prohibits this. Notice, the sin list that Paul gives, sexual sin, that's fornication. Societal sin, that's covetousness, greedy. Spiritual sins, that's idolatry. Idolatry, that means worship of island. I, idols, that sometimes the idol may be a car, a boat, or a building, or uh, the uh, cross on the wall, or some relic, or some uh, statue that's viewed as being one that I worship and bow down to. And then he goes further. The railers, that ones that's a verbal abusers, drunkard then, and or an extortioner. That means to rob or to take illegally. Paul says, don't do it. Don't say it's okay. Don't say that we love you and we're not going to confront that sin. It ought not to be that sloppy agape mentality that says we're going to embrace all of the sin that's in the world today and bring it into the fellowship of the body of Christ. The sheer pollution, the spiritual purging, the separation prohibition. But notice in verse 12 and 13, the spiritual privilege. The spiritual privilege. God's going to judge the lost world. But the believers, the church, has the right, the responsibility, the privilege of judging believers within the body of Christ. Notice what he says there. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? That's talking about outside the church. Do not ye judge them that are within? I thought we were not supposed to judge. But them that are without, God judgeth, therefore put away from among you, from among yourselves, that wicked person. Notice what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying that the lost world, God's going to judge. But within the body of Christ, we have the responsibility of judging, adjudicating, determining, calling sin, sin. We are to practice church discipline for the unrepentant, saved members. Let me illustrate that a little clear. I've got four boys. When they were growing up and we're in the grocery store, and you've seen this happen sometimes with some families, where the child will sit down on the floor, start screaming and crying and pulling something off the shelf, just got to have that. And I've seen that many times. But I can't go over and discipline that child. He's not mine. But if that had been my child, I could go over and wear him out. That's what the Scripture is saying here. The Scripture says in the body of Christ, we have the responsibility of adjudicating, calling sin, sin, and dealing with sin within the body. We don't have the responsibility. We can point out sin in the world. We can preach against sin in the world. We can point out the faults and the failures in the world, but we cannot adjudicate it from the standpoint of having the responsibility and the authority of correcting it. Only God can. But we have the responsibility in the church, he says in the text. Therefore, put away, lift out, remove from among you that wicked person. The Scripture calls it wicked. The church is to be like a surgeon removing cancer. You can take cancer and it's in the body. It can be the smallest little cancer, but if it's a progressive growing cancer, if it's left, it's going to grow and destroy the whole body. It needs to be removed. That's what Paul is saying about sin in the body of Christ. How should we respond to a message like this? It's not a pretty sounding message, is it? It's not something to go away and say, man, that was a great message. I love to hear them like that. But it's a message from the Word of God. It ought to cause us to think more clearly about what a church is to be about. It should cause us to think more soberly 
and sincerely about the body of Christ and our responsibility in the world in which we're living.